Hello and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. We're continuing with the topic of morphology and specifically in this video we'll be dealing with word formation processes, the processes that are used to create new lexical material, new words in English. Before we go into that, I'd like to briefly recapitulate uh, definitions of wordhood that I discussed in the last video. Um, I had five definitions of wordhood and uh, we saw that some of these are quite useful and some of them are quite problematic. So what is a word? How can you define a word? Um, we first looked at the so-called orthographic definition of wordhood, the idea that a word is anything that's written as a coherent chunk on the page. Now that turned, to, uh, turned out to be quite problematic. Um, also the semantic definition of wordhood, the idea that words denote um, concepts or coherent ideas, that turned out to be, well, a little problematic. More useful for our purposes was, uh, first of all, the prosodic definition, the idea that words are things that have one main stress, linguistic units that have one primary stress and perhaps a secondary stress. Um, an exception there, function words like un, the, or, to, and so on and so forth. Um, these function words, grammatical words, don't necessarily receive a primary stress, so they're problematic in this regard. Um, this here represents the integrity definition of wordhood, the idea that words are atomic, you can't split them up and insert things into the middle of them. Um, exceptions, kangaroos, and words like absolutely. Um, most useful for us really is the syntactic definition, um, the idea that words belong into different word classes, syntactic categories, and that they form the building blocks for phrases and sentences. Summing this all up, um, in this class we'll define words as the building blocks of phrases and sentences, there are members in a syntactic category, such as noun, adjective, auxiliary verb, preposition, and they are linguistic units that usually have a main stress and that are usually indivisible. Okay, with all this in mind, let's move on to the main question for today. How are new words formed in English? New words enter the English language all the time. And in fact, if you ask lay people, okay, what's changing about the language uh, these days, the first thing they'll tell you is that, oh, there are all these new words uh, that the young people use that I've never heard before, slang terms and whatnot. Well, that's true, of course, uh, that there, there are new words. Um, well, we'll talk more about language change later in this course. So, um, why should we be looking at um, word formation. Well, there are different ways of creating new words and it's interesting to consider these different ways uh, from a linguistic perspective. Um, so, the first way to create new words is to form new words from existing words and parts of existing words. So you use the material that you already have and combine it in new ways. A second strategy would be to borrow words uh, from another language into your own language. It's not really borrowing because the original language still has that word. It's more like word sharing or word copying, if you like. Right, and then a third strategy would be that new words can be made up from scratch. You can just think of the sounds that exist in your language and combine them in a new way and end up with a new word. Right. Um, in this video, I'll mainly be talking about the first option, forming new words from existing words and parts, um, which covers a range of different word formation processes. What processes will I be talking about? Well, I've singled out seven that I think are important and that you should remember. Uh, compounding, affixation, conversion, clipping, back formation, acronymy, and blending and we'll go through these one by one, starting with compounding. What's a compound? Well, you 
I guess, know at least 500 of them. Things like Skyscraper, Blackbird, um, Strawberry, perhaps. Yeah, so you know a lot of compounds. Um, now, what's interesting about compounds? Um, well, they seem to be quite trivial. You just lump together existing words. You know, existing words are put together to form a single new word. But it turns out that you can't just do this with, with any old word that comes your way. Here on this slide, I've given you a little table um, with open slots, cells, where you can insert different compounds that you know. Okay, so uh, this is meant as an exercise to come up with a compound that consists of two adjectives or um, two nouns or a verb and an adjective or a verb and a preposition. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is to pause this video and uh, keep it open and, and look at the table and take a piece of paper and try to come up with at least eight examples of compounds that you could put in the cells of this table. Okay, uh, so hit pause because I'll count to three and then I'll show you the solutions, okay, things that I have come up with. All right, pause now. One, two, three, okay, here we go. Um, here are some examples that I came up with. So adjective, adjective compounds are things like light green, noun adjective compounds, things like knee deep, um, verb adjective compounds, fail safe, and preposition adjective compounds, uh, down low, and you, you see all the rest of them here. Uh, some of these types are very frequent, very common. So for instance, um, noun noun compounds you yeah, know that's prob probably the the typical case of a, of a compound um, things like noun preposition that's quite rare yeah uh, adjective preposition also quite rare so I would venture to guess the examples that you came up with the eight cells that you filled uh, you, you you got the noun noun compound the adjective adjective compound um, and maybe the <clears throat> adjective noun cell. Um, some cells in this table really just have a handful of examples in the English language. Right, but still what this table shows is the process of compounding is quite productive really. You can do a lot by combining different types of words. Okay, one thing that I want to mention is the compound stress rule. If you look at the compounds that I've given you in this table, um, you can pronounce them and check where the main stress of these compounds lies. Okay, so in light green, poor house, blackmail, close up, runner up, brainwash, stir fry, upgrade, outlaw, pickpocket, and so on and so forth, you notice that all of them are stressed on the first syllable. And you might think, well, is this a generalization? Is this always the case? Well, there are uh, compounds that are not stressed on the first syllable. Things like computer savvy, account manager, documentary maker. They're not stressed on the first syllable. It's not computer savvy, account manager, documentary maker. Rather, it's like I pronounced them before. Okay, so um, the compound stress rule states that English compounds are stressed on the first element, okay, where the first element would usually have its main stress, that's where the main stress of the compound is. Computer savvy, okay, computer, computer savvy. All right, that's the compound stress rule, and uh, interestingly, there are some exceptions to the compound stress rule. Um, London Bridge, Boston Marathon, Penny Lane, silk tie, aluminum foil. Yeah, these are stressed on the second element. Um, and 
if you're interested in this, I can point you to a number of uh, really cool papers where people have analyzed when these exceptions occur, okay, when the compound stress rule does not apply. <clears throat> For now, um, just remember the compound stress rule and uh, remember that you can use this to distinguish between compounds on the one hand and phrases, that is, uh, combinations of words that are not a single unit. Compounds are single units, phrases are combinations of several words. Uh, they are stressed differently, okay? So a greenhouse, that's a house where you grow vegetables, um, but if you see a greenhouse, that's a normal house that's been painted green, yeah? Blackbird, that is the bird made famous by the Beatles, yeah? Blackbird. And um, any black bird, like crows and whatnot, uh, they are stressed on bird, not black. Yeah, um, jumping bean. I have no idea what a jumping bean is, but... Well, a jumping bean, that's a compound. I know it's a compound um, because jumping bean is pronounced on jumping and not on bean. Uh, if I were to talk about a bean that knows how to jump, I would ask you, well, have you seen the jumping bean? Yeah, so their jumping bean is a phrase, jumping bean, that is a compound. Um, aftershock treatment, that's a compound, and I know this because the stress is on aftershock. Um, treatment after shock, there the main stress is on shock. Yeah, so phrases, they're stressed on the right edge. Compounds, they're stressed on the first element. All right, um, more on compounds. There are three types that I'd like you to distinguish. Um, endocentric compounds are compounds in which the second element defines the kind of thing that is designated by the whole compound. And also the second element defines the word class of the compound. So a training course is a kind of course and it's a noun because a course is a noun. Battleship is a special kind of ship and it is a noun, because ship is a noun. Light green, that's a kind of green, and light green is an adjective. Knee deep is a kind of deep, and deep also is an adjective. Okay, endocentric compounds, that you might call the simple case, the typical case of how compounds work in English. There are also exocentric compounds, um, and these are if you like, the outlaws of compounding, because the meaning of the compound is not just a combination of the meanings of its parts, and uh, the whole compound also may belong to a different word class than the second element. So a big foot is not a kind of foot, yeah? Rather, it's a mythical being that has big feet, yeah, all right, but it has also legs and a behind and a back and whatnot. You could call it big body for all I care, right? But it, that also would be exocentric because, oh, well, okay. A skinhead is more than just a head. A push-up is not a kind of up, yeah? Uh, and a born-again is not a kind of again. A born-again, that's a person who has been, um, well, a, a Christian believer at first, then they strayed from the path, became alcoholics or rapists or whatnot, and then uh, they thought, oh, well, this Christian stuff is not so bad after all. They are born again. They were forgiven their sins and whatnot. Okay, born again. And that's a noun, not an adverb. Again, by itself, is an adverb. Right, exocentric compounds, the tricky stuff. Then there are copulative compounds, uh, where both elements equally define the kind of thing that's designated by the whole compounds. So uh, both, if you like, are heads of the whole compound. Um, these are examples like singer-songwriter, bittersweet, stir-fry. All right. Endocentric, exocentric, and copulative compounds. Okay, moving on to the second word formation process, the big item on the list here, really, uh, affixation. 
Um, affixation means that you have an existing word and you combine that with a part of a word. Remember last time's discussion of different affixes, different kinds of affixes. So uh, English has a large inventory of derivational affixes to form new words. Prefixes like miss, uh, misbehave, d, decaffeinated, pre, pretest, un, um, uninviting, and in, um, incompetent. Okay. Uh, then there are suffixes like li, able, ness, ism, and iti. Quite a lot of them. Quite a lot. And, um, well, I've mentioned in the last video already that the set of inflectional affixes is much smaller than the set of derivational affixes. And in inflection, there are only suffixes. Let's see, I uh, repeat the, the little poem that I, I wrote. Um, a group of cats eats John's sandwich that he topped with cheese produced by grazing cows happier than the happiest clam. If you remember these four pictures, then you remember all the inflectional affixes that the English language has on offer. Good. So, um, affixation is really interesting because it gets very complex. So many complex words have more than one affix. Think of unhappier or misjudgment or heartlessness, um, these consist of, well, a stem or a root, yeah, the lexical material that forms the basis, so to speak, and then there are these little bits and pieces that are stuck onto it. Yeah. Um, now the morphemes within a word, they are hierarchically ordered, and we can examine this more closely with the example of uncontrollably. So here, the stem, the lexical kernel of uncontrollably would be the verb control. And uh, to that, you can affix able, okay, into controllable. <clears throat> if you have controllable, you can add the prefix un and make uncontrollable. And once you have uncontrollable, you can add another suffix, li, and that will yield uncontrollably. Yeah. So you see that um, there are some affixes that are closer, more tightly integrated with the stem, and some that are at the periphery of the word. Okay, so that's hierarchical ordering of affixes. Okay. Again, please pause this video for a second and figure out the structure of undesirability. I'll count to three and then I'll... Um, oh no, there's no solution, I don't think. Right, so I'll just move on with affixation and allomorphy. Allomorphy um, describes the peculiar phenomenon that in some cases one and the same affix has different realizations depending on the context. Um, and in order to, you, you already know what allomorphy is because in session one, I told you about the WOG test. So here again are some pictures from the WOG test. Um, so there's a WOG and now there's another one. You see two of them. There are two WOGs. Uh, there are also two heaths and two gutches. And um, well, when I talked about this, I argued that okay, people know how to pluralize words that they have never heard before. So there's something, some regularity that speakers of English have internalized. And um, this regularity states that if you form the plural, um, you produce the plural suffix in different phonological shapes, namely as is after so-called sibilance, hissing sounds, so gut chiz, uh, as z after voiced sounds like wugs, and as s after voiceless sounds like heaths. Okay. Um, having these different shapes of the same suffix 
that is called allomorphy. We can give another example of allomorphy with the negative prefix in. And you see here I wrote it with a big N, which is not to designate an N, the letter N or the phoneme N. Rather, it's meant to represent a nasal sound. Um, okay. With negative in uh, adjectives, we see uh, forms like incorrect, inglorious, infrequent, insensitive, indifferent, invisible, intolerable, that are spelled with an N, and then there are things that are spelled with an M, like impossible, immortal, or imbalanced. And um, take it from me, it's the same prefix, it's just that it's pronounced differently. Okay? It's M before sounds that start that, that are bilabials, that are produced with uh, the lips touching each other. So possible, mortal, balanced. You see my lips are touching each other. And if that happens, if that is prefixed with an in, uh, the nasal is an M, okay, a bilabial nasal. If we have things like sensitive, different, visible, or tolerable, uh, it's pr pr produced as in, okay? Uh, insensitive, indifferent, invisible. Um, now here you see incorrect and inglorious. It's spelled with an N, but if you listen, it's actually produced as ing, okay? It's incorrect, it's inglorious. And that's because uh, correct and glorious are velar sounds that are sounds that are produced back here, yeah incorrect. Right, allomorphy in negative prefixation. Moving on, affixation induces, sometimes induces, stress shift. So some affixes change the stress pattern of the stem. Um, the word selective is stressed on the second syllable, selective affix this word selective with um, the affix itty, nominalizing suffix, you get selectivity. Yeah. Um, employ, stressed on the second syllable, add to this the e nominalization suffix. That's actually a, a quite non-productive um, suffix, but still, it's there. Um, employ, employee, stressed on the last syllable. Cylinder, stressed on the first syllable. Cylindric, stressed on the second one. Japan, stressed on the second syllable, versus Japanese. So ease, uh, the suffix, takes the stress towards the right edge of the word. Okay, so some of these affixes, the derivational suffixes that exist in English, change the stress pattern. Others don't. Okay? Um, so think of ness, religious, religiousness, the stress of religious just stays the same. Full, event, eventful. Nothing happening. You know, it's not becoming, uh, oh, it was very eventful. No. <clears throat> His religiousness. Yeah. Yeah. It's religiousness, eventful, interesting, interestingly. Okay. Uh, moving on to the third word formation process, conversion. Conversion is fun. Um, here is a, a comic strip with, with Calvin and Hobbes, uh, and Calvin says, uh, I like to verb words. And Hobbes says, what? And he goes on, I take nouns and adjectives and use them as verbs. Remember when access was a thing, now it's something you do. It got verbed. Verbing weirds language. Um, yeah, and, and Hobbes says, maybe we can eventually make language a complete impediment to understanding. Yeah. Okay, so conversion in English is highly productive. And um, its main use, as you may have inferred by now, is to use words from one word class as members of another class. Uh, it's very productive between nouns and verbs, but you can also take adjectives into the mix. So, um,
quite productive. Let's see. That was actually all I had on conversion. Um, clipping. Okay. Clipping. Uh, clipping, as the name suggests, is uh, shortening a word by deleting phonological material, not necessarily at morpheme boundaries, but just uh, phonological material. So you can uh, shorten professor to prof, Suzanne to Sue, influenza to flu, chopping things off at the beginning and the end. And an application you may clip to uh, app. Clipping. Backformation. Um, Backformation is interesting because it exposes thinking on parts of speakers. Now, not necessarily successful thinking, because uh, backformations reveal a um, cognitive behavior that you might call a mistake or an error, uh, because speakers misanalyze words into a stem, that is a base, and an affix, and then subtract the affix using only the base when in fact there was no base and affix to begin with. So, um, speakers came up with the verb televise from the noun television, thinking television was somehow complex, uh, made up from a noun and a suffix, a verb and a suffix, sorry. Enthuse from enthusiasm, babysit from babysitter. Um, let me give you an ex historical example from English, uh, namely the word cherry. Cherry. Um, what was borrowed from, well, how, how cherry came about is that cherries was a word that was borrowed from um, Norman French, who talked about cerise, and the speakers of, of English thought that the final z in a series was actually a plural, the plural S that they were all familiar with, okay? So uh, people heard series and thought, okay, uh, series, that's, that's many of them because usually there are many series. Um, so if I want just one of them, I'll just leave out the final Z and say cherry. Okay, it's a mistake. But still, today, everybody says cherry, not thinking twice about this. Right, that brings us to acronymy. Um, acronyms are words that are derived from the initial sounds of several words, things like NASA, UNESCO, laser, or radar. And, um, well, acronyms are pronounced as words. Whereas uh, other shortenings, like initialisms, for instance, they are like acronyms except that they are pronounced as a sequence of letters. Think of ACDC, uh, PC, or SUV. Okay, It's not SUV, that would be an acronym, it's SUV, an initialism. Okay, the last item on the list, and actually my favorite one, uh, blending. Here I've brought you a little picture of an animal and I would like you to pause this video for a third time and think of a proper name that you would give to this animal. And I'm not thinking of a name like George or um, Elizabeth, Michael, no, I, I, you know, a word that describes the species of this animal. What's the species of this animal? Again, I'll count to three and then we'll see what I came up with. Uh, one, two, three. Well, I came up with chicodile. It really looks like a chicodile, to me at least. And I venture to guess that some of you came up with chicodile as well. Why am I telling you this? Why am I showing you pictures of our crazy animals? Well, um, blending is the process of making one word out of two other words, taking the beginning of one word and the end of another. And you'll notice that chickadile has the beginning of chicken and the end of crocodile. A bit like the picture of the chicken head and the crocodile tail. 
Okay, there is something called the blending rule. And the blending rule is written almost like a beautiful mathematical formula. Now, it's not quite the law of Pythagoras, but, you know, it's almost as nice. And the blending rule is AB plus CD equals AD. That's the blending rule. So uh, goat and sheep are blended into geep. Um, but interestingly, not into gop. And there's a reason why people say geep, not gop, because um, we'll talk about syllable structure here. Um, the main point of the blending rule is that blends cannot separate the nucleus of a syllable from the coda of a syllable. What's the nucleus and what's the coda of a syllable? Well, here I've given you these diagrams of syllables um, that's diagrammed in such a way and you see that syllables have different parts um, an onset a nucleus and a coda and nucleus and coda they belong together in uh, what is called the rhyme um, okay, the rhyme blends can't mess with the rhyme you can't split the rhyme that's essentially what it is. So if you want to combine words, you can uh, separate the onset from the rhyme, but you can't split up the rhyme. So um, if you were to say gop, you would actually use the onset and the nucleus from goat and the coda from sheep. That's not possible. So you have to say geep, not gop. Okay, I prepared two little exercises here. How do you blend linguist and magician? A bit more complex because they have more syllables. Linguist and magician. Pause the video if you have to. Um, I will now move on to one possible solution, namely linguagician. linguagician. Um, and uh, here I diagrammed the different syllables of linguist and magician. Uh, and I separated the onset from the rhyme. So ling, gu, and then the third syllable is uh, being omitted. And in magician, the onset from the first syllable is omitted, but the rhyme, the uh, is kept, which gives us linguagician, linguagician. All right. Um, so you see that. Um, a, B plus C, D equals A, D. But that's not the only possible way to blend linguist and magician. You could just say lingua, linguician. A linguician is uh, a magician who uses linguistics or vice versa. And here we use the, sec the first two syllables of linguist and uh, only the rhyme from the second syllable of magician and then the last syllable of magician, linguition. Okay, that's how blending works. Um, and that really completes our overview of word formation processes, compounding, affixation, conversion, clipping, back formation, acronymy, and blending. Okay, that was it for this time, and I'll see you next week.